Hey, hello. Uh, no, no preamble this week. We've got a guest who's done a whole bunch of stuff and sort of embodies what this whole podcast is about. So I didn't think I could find a punchy intro that does our conversation justice. I will say, though, that you're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell. And my guest this week... Where to start? I'm I'm so excited to share my conversation with Russ Fazio. If you were to make a Mount Rushmore of opinion science, Russ's head would definitely be up there. I was actually just reading some old political science papers and, oh, hey, they're citing Fazio. A lot of what we know about opinions and how they work comes back to research that Russ has done at one point or another. He's a social psychologist and his earliest work goes back to the 70s when he was an undergrad at Cornell. Today, he's a professor at Ohio State University, and in the intervening time between his college days and now, his research has included game-changing work on cognitive dissonance, implicit bias, automatic cognition, negativity biases, and the relationship between attitudes and behavior, among a bunch of other things that I'm not even mentioning. It was also a highlight for me to talk to Russ for the podcast because I've known him for about 13 years, going back to when I started my PhD at Ohio State in 2010. I didn't work with Russ directly, but I went to his lab meetings, he was on my thesis and dissertation committees, and his methodical approach to research has always been an inspiration. So I was super excited to learn that he listens to this podcast. Hi, Russ, (laughs) if you're listening to this one. Uh, And that he was game for being a guest on it. We were able to record this in the studios at WOSU, so we got to be in the same room as each other, and I didn't even have to monitor the levels myself. We got to talk about his earliest research on the kinds of opinions that guide our behavior, about the fundamental nature of having likes and dislikes, and about how a simple video game featuring a bunch of beans, yeah, beans, gives us a glimpse into some of the key challenges human beings face every day. So let's just get right to it. In terms of the the grand scheme of your career, which has encompassed in some ways so many different things, but when I look at it, I see similarities, right? Like it doesn't seem like you completely run circles and (laughs) jump from totally dissimilar things to each other. Uh And so I want to get your take, like what to you is the driving force behind all the questions that you've found yourself curious about? Like, is there, if you were to tell someone like, I ultimately do studies about this, like, what would you tell people? Interesting question, Andy. Um, there, there is definitely a theme. There's no question. I, I think uh, I've been following a very, very programmatic <laughs> series of studies ever since really an undergraduate. Um, but the but the fundamental interest always has been in attitudes, um, and and all I, all I mean by an attitude is a, a like and a dislike or a dislike, just kind of a fundamental evaluation of some object that could be a person, it could be a place, it could be a thing, it can be an issue, but some evaluation. And uh, I just have been curious about attitudes for the, the longest time. For at the beginning, it was questions having to do with. What at one point was a very, very serious controversy in the field, uh, whether attitudes actually had any impact upon behavior. And there was considerable skepticism about that. And I remember even as an undergraduate scratching my head and saying, wait a minute. How, how, how can that be? There's got to be a connection between likes and dislikes in people's behavior so that maybe we've got to ask more nuanced questions about that issue. But from there, I turned to questions about, okay, what kinds of attitudes under what situations will indeed affect behavior? And that led to questions about, well, how, how might we even think about how attitudes are represented in memory and how they're activated from memory? And assuming they are activated... <laughs> What, what do they do? And in particular, what do they do for the individual? They must have some functional value or, or this entire system would not have developed in the first place. So what is that functional value? So that got us into questions regarding attention and 
uh, judgment processes. Um, that was really a long part of my career. But then at a later point, I began, kind of became interested in questions regarding attitude formation. And, okay, if some kinds of attitudes do this, how did they get formed in the first place? And what are the consequences of that formation process? So it, it's always been a concern with kind of fundamental evaluative processes. Why? I'm curious. So, so like, these are all, I agree, interesting questions because <laughs> they're in the world of the things that I do too. But but I, I'm just like you've... You haven't jumped ship. You jumped ship. You you could have. <laughs> like you could have stopped studying attitudes a long time ago if you wanted to. What keeps you coming back? Like why are dislikes so alluring as a research topic? I think they're they're, they're so central to daily life that, that they connect to so much of individual social behavior. That that's what makes them so fascinating. <laughs> they they really so much of our day is full of approach avoidance behaviors that are determined by our likes or our dislikes. You know, so I go into a, a, a diner for lunch and immediately I'm <laughs> faced with decisions. I have to make a choice and likes and dislikes are guiding that process. I walk down the street and I see somebody that I happen to like or somebody that I really don't like. <laughs> What do I do? Do I cross the other side of the street? Do I <laughs> greet the person? Those are all things that occur daily. And yet, I think most people will agree that they don't really give much conscious thought to those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of just somehow happen. And that's been the fascination for me. How do these things happen? Mm -hmm. um, is, but I think more generally, these are the kinds of fundamental questions that I have long been interested in. I've, I've really always had an interest in processes that are, are fundamental in the sense that they affect a wide range of domains. And uh, I think that's why it's continues to be interesting to me. Mm -hmm. The example, I might have given it on the show before, but the example that I always come to as a case of the compulsion to evaluate <laughs> is when you go see a movie and after the fact, it's the first thing anyone talks about is whether they liked it, whether it was good, whether it was bad. Like we, It's like you could have just watched the movie and then gone to dinner, but you go, no, I got to tell you what I thought about it. And the whole time you're going, is this a good movie or is this a bad movie? And no one tells us you have to have this opinion. <laughs> And yet we, we are just compelled to, to form it and, and, and don't give much thought to it. Yeah. And not, not only are we kind of compelled to share it or mm -hmm. to form the evaluation as well as share it, um, but a year later, what we remember about the movie <laughs> is that we liked it or disliked it. Yeah. It was a good movie or a bad movie. We rarely remember all the details. Yeah, it is <laughs> the same the case. with the book that we read. Because, yeah, we remember like the affect, <laughs> but not the basis for the affect. Uh -huh. I want to, so you mentioned that this stuff started in, in undergrad, which is also, I mean, I looked at your CV, and the first line is an attitudes paper. <laughs> Man, it was there at the very beginning. And the, the dorm study, the dorm crisis study, was that your honors thesis? Am I remembering that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and that was, I mean, I still cite that. <laughs> that still is a relevant thing that, that, that you came up with. Uh -huh. And so was it just like a good social psychology class that introduced you to this? I mean, I didn't know about attitude behavior consistency as a college student. <laughs> it was a very, very good class. Uh, I was very fortunate to take a class as a sophomore with a, a brilliant instructor at Cornell named Dennis Regan. And he had this uncanny ability to present an experiment in a way that just made you engrossed with the method. <laughs> and, okay, the result is terrific, and it told us something, but how we learned that was what was really amazing. And I walked away from that class thinking, wow, you can actually study human social behavior experimentally. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I was just engrossed from that point on, and I was very fortunate that... Dennis Regan kind of took me on as a student and 
really in my last year or two there, treated me more like a graduate student than an undergrad. I got to do a lot of work, a lot of research with him, and it eventually led to publications. But um, the work that you mentioned on um, the undergraduate housing crisis really stemmed from an issue that he had raised in the class, this skepticism about the attitude-behavior relation. And he had thrown out in class a couple thoughts about why that might, might or might not be and raised the possibility that when an attitude was itself grounded in behavior, maybe it'd be more likely to affect later behavior. That, it was a vague idea, but we turned that into, eventually through discussion, thoughts about two different ways in which people might form attitudes. Sometimes we form attitudes just because people tell us <laughs> about some issue or so, another person, whatever it might be. That's kind of indirect experience. Other times we form attitudes because we directly interact with the person, directly interact with the issue in terms of advocacy, whatever it might be. But those seem very, very different. And so the thought was, well, maybe if an attitude is based upon direct experience, it will actually have a greater effect upon subsequent behavior. And it just so happened that at the time, there was this very interesting housing crisis going on at Cornell, and it occurred to me that, wait a minute, we've got an opportunity here to do a really interesting kind of field study, because there are some students, freshmen, who are very much affected by this housing crisis. They're living in some temporary housing quarters during their first weeks on campus. You know, they've got a cot and a lounge. Come on. <laughs> you know, whereas other students obviously have the more typical experience of being assigned to a dormitory room, and yet they're certainly aware of the housing crisis. They're certainly aware that some students are in temporary housing. So we have a kind of a natural manipulation here of direct versus indirect experience with the housing crisis. So, um, yeah. And, and just was, to clarify, so uh, this is that, like, there were not enough rooms for everyone exactly. who, who came to campus. And so just probably at random you go hey sorry but uh you don't have a dorm room i know you brought all your stuff here but we do have a cot set up in the lobby <laughs> and just sort of like throw your stuff over there and welcome to cornell <laughs> yes wouldn't you love to have yeah. that as your first experience with college but that happened to a good number of students uh, i mean fortunately it did not last very long i think at, at most, it was six weeks that students were in that kind of situation. Still, that's a long, long time. Um, but nevertheless, those were people who were directly affected by the housing crisis, whereas others were not. So we were able to send uh, students who had been in temporary housing as well as a group of students who had been in permanent housing a lengthy questionnaire about their feelings regarding the housing crisis, as well as a number of behaviors, behavioral opportunities. So they could, they were invited to sign a petition. They were invited to write a letter to the housing office, things of that sort. Um, so we actually had some indices of behavior that we could correlate with people's attitudes toward the housing crisis. And, and we did find that people in the permanent housing situation had attitudes that had actually less of an impact, did not predict as well their behavior, whereas those in the temporary housing situation, those with direct experience, were much more likely to perform behaviors that were indeed consistent with their attitude. If they thought the housing crisis was, in, crack, in fact, very severe, they were very, very, very much against it, they were much more likely to write a letter, to circulate a petition, things of that sort. So the, the attitudes here are like, how bad is the crisis? Is, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so the original formulation of what attitudes are supposed to be would have said, well, anyone who says— that the housing crisis is bad should be willing to write a petition, to, to sign a petition, to write a letter, to do all this stuff. But lo and behold, there are plenty of people who say, oh, wow, what a terrible crisis. I, I'm not going to bother myself <laughs> to actually take any action because it, that 
feeling that it was bad wasn't born out of a real personal experience, right? It was indirectly learned that, oh, wow, this sounds bad. (laughs) That's a very good way to summarize the phenomenon, that those with direct experience would have felt more motivated to, in fact, act upon their attitudes. When given the opportunity to do so, we presented them with an opportunity. Do they take advantage of it? Do you happen to remember? I have this image in mind of of uh, college student Russ thinking about attitudes and suddenly coming across a news story about this housing crisis and going, Eureka, <laughs> this is the way we can do it. Do, do you have any, I mean, this is a while ago now, any recollection of like, oh, wow, this thing that's actually affecting people is exactly the way for us to, to test that question that our professor mentioned in class. It was a long time ago, so <laughs> this would very be very much be a reconstructive memory process subject to all kinds of biases. But yes, I do recall it as kind of a eureka moment. Like, what's going on here is exactly the phenomenon that we were intrigued by, attitudes that are grounded in behavior versus not. Um, so we were able to take advantage of the situation and did that study, which you know found these very interesting results. But then I remember thinking with Dr. Regan's en- encouragement that we needed a true experiment. <laughs> and how do we how might we bottle this in the in the laboratory? And that led to the creation of the puzzle paradigm because, from my perspective, attitudes were nothing more than likes and dislikes. We like all kinds of things. We dislike all kinds of things, including mundane things like various kinds of puzzles, uh, crossword puzzles, mazes, whatever it might be. So the thought was, could we manipulate direct versus indirect experience with puzzles, allow people to form attitudes towards some relatively novel puzzles that they were unlikely to have much familiarity with, but allow them to do so by either actually having the opportunity to work those puzzles versus simply being told about those puzzles and being shown examples by the experimenter. Would the resulting attitudes be different in their likelihood of affecting later behavior? So the the ultimate Part of the experiment involved a 15-minute free play situation where I placed three pages of each of the five types of puzzles (laughs) on a desk in front of the participant and said, you know, feel free to work these in any order that you like. Feel free to work on any that you want, not others. Uh, All I ask you to do is please number each puzzle as you attempt to solve it. So that allowed us to look at which puzzle types people actually tried and the order in which they tried them. So we could actually have a behavioral measure and relate that to how interesting people had found each of the puzzles prior to that free play situation. It does something uh, that those two studies in concert kind of exemplify the great promise (laughs) of basic attitudes research, which is the same thing that drives you to want to play this word search again after you realized you liked it is the same thing that makes you want to sign a petition because you've been sleeping on a cot for the last week. Uh, that that at, this, at the core of both of those is the same thing, is I have come to like or dislike this either because I experienced it myself or didn't. And so that should be all I need to know <laughs> to predict whether I'm going to do something about this in the next opportunity. Very nice summary. That's exactly (laughs) uh, exactly the point, I think, of those two initial studies. And uh, it just started my entire program of research that's occupied me for (laughs) decades now (laughs) Uh, because I very much was the kind of person, the kind of social psychologist who once I obtained an experimental finding it was like, well, what's that imply? What's the next question? What's that that suggests? And kind of one study led to another study. It really was just the data mm-hmm. <laughs> leading us down a trail. It, it ended up being the focus of decades of my time. 
I think too the so the 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 idea that these experimental bottlings up of ideas can can tell us a lot. I, I think some people have a hard time understanding or believing that. Like I, I imagine some people could listen to this and go, what, I, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> whether I like a puzzle tells me the same thing about psychology as whether I'm sleeping on a cot. And so I'm curious if you were to kind of lay out the strongest case for attitudes are basic, right? This is just like th there's a, a core set of rules that our brain uses to go through its day. And whether it's about housing crises or puzzles or beans, <laughs> it's it's building on the same software. I mean, does that does that capture how you think about this? Definitely does. I, I definitely think of attitudes as that fundamental and the nature of the object, it can be something very, very serious, like <laughs> that housing crisis that's got me stuck in a temporary housing situation for six weeks. Or it can be something very, very silly, mundane, like my liking for a puzzle. But the process <laughs> is the same in each of those situations. And what's, what's different is simply the nature of the attitude object. But the attitude is still driving the behavior as a function of similar kinds of processes. And, and that really was the focus of the next probably 20 years of my research career, to try to understand that process and why the process could indeed be the same across a wide variety of domains. But if I were to lay out, you asked me to kind of lay out the fundamental process that unifies all that, it really has to do with, or at least begins, with when you, when you encounter that person, that thing, that somebody mentions that policy issue to you, what happens? Is, is it possible that your evaluation gets activated from memory very easily? Maybe even without your having to think much about it. it. just might happen, quote, automatically, inescapably. Well, it certainly seems like that could happen, right? We've got lots of other learned associations that are, in fact, of that quality, that have that kind of automaticity to them. So if, if I say salt to you, you can't help but think of pepper, mm -hmm. right? April 15th, taxes, <laughs> right? These are really well-learned semantic associations. Well, maybe our attitudes could be similarly well-learned. The, the example I often like to give largely because it's so contrary to my own experience. I happen I happen to love anchovies. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going. Okay, anchovies, okay. I'm on board. <laughs> but how many times have I been in a situation where we're ordering pizza and somebody suggests anchovies and there's this immediate yuck reaction from somebody in the group, right? An immediate yuck reaction. It's not like they thought about it. It just happened automatically. So that's a very, for that person, a very strong negative association that gets activated automatically upon mere mention <laughs> of anchovies. So it certainly seems like some of our attitudes could be of that sort. And what actually led us to that question was, and this is what I mean by one study's findings leading to the next question. We were wondering, well, why do attitudes based upon direct experience have more impact than those based upon indirect experience? Well, there could be lots of reasons for that. And, and one reason turns out to be that people are simply more confident that their attitude is correct when it's based upon direct experience. We assessed that in some of the earlier research. But we then wondered, well, why? <laughs> why are they more confident? <laughs> what does it even mean to be confident? Yeah, what it, does it mean? And what does it mean in terms of the mechanism that could ultimately affect the behavior? And that got us to thinking that, well, maybe these attitudes involve, when they're based upon direct experience, involve these very strong, well-learned associations, associations between the evaluation and the object in question. And when that object is presented as a result, the attitude is very accessible from memory and likely to be activated automatically. 
Okay. Well, if that happens, what's going to go on? Well, suddenly you've got this filter through which you're seeing the world at that moment in time. Everything's biased by this positivity or this negativity. So any information in the present environment is basically construed through the lens of positivity or negativity that's been automatically activated. And in that way could affect your assessment, your perceptions of the attitude object in that immediate situation, which then would impact your behavior. Without your ever having to really think about it, to, quote, engage in conscious decision-making, just kind of flows spontaneously. The other, your, your anchovy example also is making me think of, um, there's an example you give in a paper where you say, imagine someone has a horrible peanut allergy and uh, you present them with peanuts. They're obviously going to have an automatic negative aversion. And when I uh, we read that in my uh, grad seminar, I go, you know who has a peanut allergy? Russ Fazio, the writer of this paper, <laughs> has a peanut allergy. But it's like, it, it is the perfect, very intuitive case of this where if, if that's you and someone pulls out a jar of peanut butter, like, thank goodness we do this. <laughs> thank goodness your brain goes, whoa, 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 whoa. That's one of those things that we absolutely don't touch. Um, but the insight goes beyond that to go, it's the same as you, someone pulls out a Starbucks cup and you have an immediate reaction to because it, it lives. It's just kind of sitting there <laughs> dormant in your head until something in the environment reminds you like, oh, this is one of those things you like or this is one of those things that terrifies you. And, and we can't help but have that reaction. Yes, I do have a peanut allergy. <laughs> and, and yes, what you just described is the is a perfect illustration of the functional value of attitudes. If, if I did not have that kind of strong association, I might not be as attentive to the presence of peanuts in the environment. I, I might not be the kind of person that looks at a set of ingredients <laughs> to see if there's peanut oil. Um, but it, it just leads to this vigilance. And if I detect evidence of peanuts... It's a very clear indicator that I should stay away. Okay. Now, again, the, the, in, the, that is just so very, very functional. It, if I did not do that, I risk having an allergic reaction that could, in fact, kill me. <laughs> so um, it, it just proves to be very, very useful to have this kind of system. And I, I think it shows that how human memory is so critical. and We develop these kinds of associations in memory because they are of value to us. And as, as a result of that, we, re, we come to rely upon them to help us get through daily life without having to spend much effort, much time deliberating about issues. Do I, in fact, approach or avoid this? Well, the attitude, if it's automatically activated, makes that decision for us, or at least guides us. And hence, we don't have to expend as much energy in order to make that decision. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about this automatic activation idea. This is within the last year or so. You know, I've known about this idea for ages, but only recently have I realized like how important that is. Like, I mean, that, that sells the importance of attitudes, that... <laughs> We, we just cannot help but be reminded of where we stand on something the the second it appears in our field of view. Um, but it is, I, I always find it kind of hard to talk about because it's an abstract idea that this notion of like and dislike emerges automatically. <laughs> could, could you spell out, like, what do you mean? Like, when you envision that, what does it look like to you? for an attitude to be automatically activated by some stimulus? Well, I think it, it's probably easiest to understand if we just think of memory as a, really this is more of a metaphor, but you can imagine that memory just involves a set of associations, like salt and pepper, pe pe pepper bread and butter. Those are Nothing more than two terms that are associated. Well, if we think of an attitude 
in that same way, the, the working in memory the same way, then attitude formation amounts to developing this association between the attitude object and your evaluation of the object. And through rehearsal, through the sheer emotionality of one's experiences with an attitude object, through just observation of our behavior, that association could become really strong. And the stronger it becomes, the more capable it is of this kind of automatic activation. So any school child can probably tell you that the capital of Ohio is Columbus, but some elementary school children in New York, they might get the answer correct too, but they'd have to think about it a while, right? <laughs> they, they'd struggle with it. it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I do remember hearing that. It is, I think it's Columbus. It's not Columbia. It's Columbus. It, they have to expend much more effort to retrieve that particular association from memory. Whereas the child that's rehearsed that association can do so much more readily. And I think the same is true of our likes and dislikes. Sometimes they're relatively weak, but sometimes they're relatively strong and, and have that capability of just emerging automatically by mere mention of the uh, attitude object. It, it, it might also help to unpack like, how could we know this? Like, this just sounds like two philosophers talking about, like, what might be true <laughs> about the brain. And short of, you know, calling up the gods and being like, how do we, uh, is this what happens automatically? H how do we know? How, how could a mere mortal <laughs> uh, like one of us know that these are inescapable compulsions to be reminded of where you stand on something? Very good question. And again, it's one that occupied us for a good number of years <laughs> because we wanted to demonstrate and get a handle on that particular impact of attitudes. So there's a couple ways. Um, an indirect way, it's not perfect, but it kind of resembles that Columbus is the capital of Ohio situation for the New Yorker versus for the Ohio resident. We could look at how quickly do they respond. So we actually spent a good number of years using that as our measure of what we called attitude accessibility, the ease of retrieving an attitude from memory or constructing an attitude in response to the question, whichever it might be. So we looked at what we called latency of response to an attitudinal query, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I present you with an attitudinal question. Do you like Starbucks cappuccinos? And I look at how long it takes you to respond, yes or no, or good, bad, like, dislike. And we can easily accommodate that in the laboratory with a task in which we instruct people that we are going to present them with the names of attitude objects. And in response to each, they have to, as quickly as possible, press a like button or a dislike button. And we're going to measure the latency with which they can respond. So in that work, we treated faster latencies of response as an indication of a more accessible attitude, one that was more likely to be automatically activated from memory. And we did a lot of work where we just used that kind of measurement procedure and found that attitudes, in fact, that people could uh, respond quickly to when, it, when asked we're in fact more likely to have an effect upon later behavior. So we'd broken down direct versus indirect experience into something more fundamental, more abstract, that it was the accessibility of that attitude in memory that really determined whether the attitude had a strong effect upon later behavior. We even did some work where we tried to manipulate attitude accessibility. So could we make people make people's attitudes such that they were faster to respond to a query? 
Well, yeah. Just have people practice it. <laughs> Say it over and over again. Cappuccino, great. Cappuccino, great. Love cappuccino. <laughs> right? That rehearses the association, and it grows stronger as a result of that rehearsal. And in fact, people then will respond faster to a uh, query about their attitudes. But more importantly, if we go back to our puzzle paradigm, and we have people rehearse their attitudes toward these various different kinds of puzzles, just practice them over and over again, then we find that the attitude had a bigger impact upon their decisions during the free play situation. So that kind of attitude rehearsal actually led to the development of an attitude that was more impactful in terms of affecting later behavior. And when you say you're timing how long it takes for people to respond to these queries. It's not like you're sitting there with your cappuccino and a stopwatch and clicking it yourself. Like, you're getting real fine-grained ideas about how long it's taking people to respond to this, which is also like a bit of a technological marvel within psychology <laughs> that we can do something like that. And, I mean, this was probably the early 80s, probably, when you started doing the response early time 80s, stuff. Early 80s, yeah. So what does, what does getting pin perfect accurate reaction times in the early 80s look like? I, I was very fortunate at Indiana University to uh, have the support of a wonderful uh, electronics shop. Hmm. So the very first work that we did involved a small Texas Instruments microprocessor. Mm. <laughs> uh, microcomputers were not even available at the time, but this was a small microprocessor that the engineers were able to uh, connect um, response boxes to, and we would present um, a slide on the individual's screen and that slide would have on it, say, the name of an attitude object, like um, Starbucks cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> and the individual was instructed to respond, good, bad, like, dislike, as quickly as possible in response to each of these trials. The microprocessor would start its clock as soon as the slide actually fell from the slide projector <laughs> down into the position where it was being transmitted. It was a physical signal? It was a physical oh, wow. signal in those early days. That would start the microprocessor's clock. The participant's press of a button would stop the clock, and that would reside in this microprocessor's memory. <laughs> for a very short time until the end of the session when we printed out, <laughs> believe it or not, the results. And printed it was just like a latencies. receipt of numbers. But it was accurate, yes, but it was accurate to the millisecond, hmm. which was amazing at that time. Um, and those were the early experiments, all dependent upon that particular technology. Eventually, we bought our first Apple II microcomputer. <laughs> this is like... 1982 or so, <laughs> and uh, we began to use microcomputers to do these kinds of assessments. So we no longer had to rely upon a slide projector, and um, so we were able to move move things along much more quickly than we had with the earlier research. The latency data were actually recorded on a floppy disk, <laughs> and hence available for data analysis much more readily than our printed uh, thermal <laughs> output. <laughs> so so that that's the, the technology and the method behind knowing that to you, this attitude lives like right at the front of your head, like you're ready to yank it out. Whereas for someone else, it's going to take them a second to, to come to where they, they think about it. But there's another part of this automaticity question, which is, if I just show you that Starbucks cup, and Starbucks is getting so much free accidental press. Yes, <laughs> I'm not honest. sure why that example <laughs> ended up being so center, but central I, here. I, I show you a picture of that cup, and I, I can know that your opinion of Starbucks entered your mind 
without me ever actually asking you what you think about Starbucks. This is another, I think, I mean, in terms of how we can know about what's going on in people's heads. <laughs> I mean, and this is pre, you know, putting electrodes in someone's brain. You still, through some tight <laughs> engineering and logic, can know that, can know that someone just compulsively reminded themselves of their opinion, even though I never asked you your opinion. So what, how do we know that? That was the next step in the research program. So you're very correct. Latency response to an attitudinal inquiry still begins with an inquiry. <laughs> so it's not spontaneous automatic activation of the attitude from memory. Presumably, that's what enables you to respond so quickly, but it all began with my asking you the question. So in that sense, it's different. So we needed a different kind of paradigm, a procedure by which we could have some indication that an individual's attitude had been automatically activated without having to ask them the question. And I was very fortunate at the time to be learning about automatic processing from Richard Schifrin at uh, Indiana University, who was clearly one of the pioneers in that very distinction between automatic and controlled processing. Um, at the time that I arrived at Indiana, Rich had just published two very, very impactful papers on the topic. And that it certainly influenced my thinking as I was considering all of this and developing this program of research. And at the same time, I began to read about how some cognitive psychologists were ass assessing uh, automatic activation. And it was through what they called a priming paradigm. Um, really fascinating kind of work. In, in the cognitive work, it usually, had, it usually arose in a context of reading and um, what are called lexical decisions. Is this really a word or a non-word? So if I present you with R-O-B-I-N, Robin, you'll be quicker to tell me it is actually a word if I precede Robin with presentation of the word bird. Okay, so bird must have activated some associations in memory about what kinds of things are birds. Well, Robin is a classical kind of bird, and now I'm ready to see those letters and can identify it as a word more quickly. So we began to think, well, maybe, maybe the same could be done with attitudes and with evaluations. So let's suppose I give people the job of telling me whether an adjective means good or bad. Amazing. Does it mean good or bad? Objectionable. Does it mean good or bad? Well, those are easy decisions, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very easy. Good but again, and bad, respectively, we, for we those could, playing along at home. <laughs> we can look at the latency with which people respond to that question. Mm -hmm. So we began to think, well, would somebody be faster to tell me that, let's say, disgusting means bad if I precede disgusting with the word cockroach? If they are, that would seem to suggest that negativity got automatically activated in response to disgusting and made you all the more ready to recognize disgusting as bad, as implying negativity. Just to correct, I think, so, so seeing a cockroach reminded me of just bad stuff, <laughs> and that got me ready to see the word disgusting as a bad word, right? Correct. In the early work, we did not have the technological sophistication to present photos, present images, so it was not actually a <laughs> picture of a cockroach. It was simply the word cockroach. 
But eventually we did get to the point where we were able to present color images. Again, we were at the time on kind of the bleeding edge <laughs> of what uh, microcomputers were capable of doing. Um, but yes, eventually it was pictures. So I can present a photo of a cockroach to you and immediately thereafter present the word disgusting. You'll be faster to tell me disgusting means bad. On the other hand, I can follow cockroach by the word desirable, and it'll actually slow you down in terms of telling me that desirable means good. So we can look at the response to positive versus negative adjectives and get an indication of what evaluation got activated from memory upon presentation of that particular attitude object. The, the early work, as I said, was all done with words. Um, and we actually created a, a, a cover story that proved critical to the f uh, phenomenon. So what we would do is tell people that we were interested in how well people could judge evaluative meaning. So we were going to be presenting them with adjectives, and they needed to respond as quickly as possible to indicate that that adjective meant good or bad. But to see just how good people were at this, in the critical part of the experiment, what we were going to do is present them with a memory word. They had to remember that word until the end of the trial. Then they would be presented with the target adjective and respond to that target adjective by pressing the good button or the bad button, and then recite the memory word aloud. So cockroach would come up on the screen. Okay, got to remember that. That in part ensured that they read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then we present the word disgusting. How quickly do they tell me that disgusting means bad? And then they say cockroach aloud. That was the early paradigm that we used. It eventually evolved to the point where we could tell people, again, we were interested in how well people could judge word meaning, but we're going to present them with photos. And these were photos that they would have to remember because we were going to have them do a recognition test later in the experiment. So could they recognize the particular photos that were presented? And again, that permitted us to get an index, an estimate of what people's evaluation was, what was activated in memory at the moment that they had been presented with that particular photo. There, there are two things about this that I want to emphasize, and <laughs> we'll stick with the cockroach example, but to be clear, like, this was not just a cockroach study. I mean, it was dozens of things that you were showing people before these adjectives. But one is if we stick with cockroaches, at no point are you asking people, do you like cockroaches? Like within this game itself, you're never asking that. But still, I know, I know you didn't like that cockroach <laughs> because it made you real quick to tell me that disgusting was a bad word and it made you stumble over telling me that amazing was a good word. Um, and the other thing is that, I mean, it's just, it's just so beautiful <laughs> the way all the pieces come together. Because if we were just dispassionate observers of the universe and seeing a cockroach just washes over us as just something in the environment, it would have nothing to do with whether I know that disgusting is a word that is negative and that amazing is a word that is positive. The fact that I am made quicker <laughs> or slower tells me, go oh, that cockroach got to you, didn't it? Like, <laughs> I never said to be bothered or not by it. But the fact that it affected your response on this other unrelated thing tells me that it did something to the way you were thinking about the world. Exactly. Th those latency data, whether the response was facilitated or interfered with by the presentation of the photo, in this case of a cockroach, that gave us a glimpse into what was going on in memory without ever having to ask the person. So we got a sense of what associations that individual has toward that attitude object, again, without ever having to ask. So that was the beginning of what eventually became known as implicit measures of attitude. So the notion is that we have this indirect means of getting an indication of what an individual's attitude is without having to directly pose the question. 
So that was really the essence of what grew into a large body of work conducted not only by us, but by a large number of people in the field concerning implicit measures of attitude. Okay, so so we're going to shift from cockroaches to beans, which is going to sound stark. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're, we're, we're pivoting only a little bit. I, so I think kind of the most recent kind of collection of work that, that you have, and maybe you could, maybe there's a, I'm missing something, uh, is, is this stuff on the meaning of negative and positive and how we go from one of our attitudes to another. So <laughs> we can start with this notion of, of beans, what, what we're going to talk about here. Uh, Beanfest is this uh, game that that was born of <laughs> trying to solve some problem. And what was that problem? I, I get the sense, again, if I'm to paint the Hollywood picture of the Russ Fazio story, your, your brain is plagued with this problem, <laughs> losing sleep over. How could we know that this is happening? And Beanfest was born as a result. What was it? What was that problem that you were itching to solve? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier, eventually I kind of became interested in the question of attitude formation. How, how obviously, direct versus indirect experience was attitude formation. But more generally, how do we form attitudes toward objects? And so after having learned all of this about attitude accessibility and how atti accessible attitudes affect attention, judgment, and behavior, I really became more fascinated in that initial step. How do they form in the first place? Beanfest itself <laughs> grew out of <laughs> um, my being a visiting professor at the University of Exeter, um, working with a social psychologist there named Dick Iser. And I still remember vividly Dick and I walking across campus to go to the faculty club for lunch and my telling him about this fantasy that I'd always had about wouldn't it be great to create this kind of virtual world in which you could know a given person's experiences with each and every object <laughs> that they encounter in the world so that you know their history and could see how their attitudes develop as a result of their history of experiences. Dick at the time was very much interested in connectionist modeling. And this just kind of struck a chord with him because it was clearly something that could be modeled in a connectionist framework. So we started tossing that around and came up with the idea of, okay, it's not a very realistic world, but what if we asked people to live in a world that consisted only of beans? And I'm, I'm sure this was the English context. Uh -huh. this, this would not have arisen anywhere other than uh, the UK. But what if we lived in a, asked people to live in a world filled with beans? And the beans naturally vary. They vary in terms of their shape. You know, we got circular ones, oval, oblong, and they vary in terms of the number of speckles that they have. And what if some of those beans, when you ate them, were good? They, they increased your energy level. Other beans, when you ate them, they hurt you. They made you sick. Would we see people develop attitudes toward these different types of beans as a consequence of the choices they made. So as their, as their experiences with these different types of beans developed, their attitudes would develop. That was the initial impetus. And so I got back to Indiana, and we decided to try to create the stimuli for exactly that. Beanfest arose. And so in the Beanfest game, people, in fact, are presented with beans that vary in terms of shape, 10 different levels. They vary in terms of the number of speckles that they have from 1 to 10. And we can present different types of beans to participants during the, quote, learning or game phase of the experiment. And they're presented with a bean, say a circular bean with very few speckles. And if they choose that bean, if they eat it, then they're they experience the consequence that's associated with that being. 
If circles with few speckles are good, their energy level increases. If circles with few speckles are bad, they lose energy. And we told people their, their mission <laughs> in this new virtual world is to survive. And they're only going to survive by exploring the world because eventually, just as a function of time, they will lose energy. So they've got to learn which beans are good and which beans are bad. And we've just found some fascinating consequences of that little exercise. So the ex experiment concludes with a test phase. So after people go through this game phase where they're trying to maintain their energy levels, we put them through a test phase where we present them with beans and simply ask them, was this a good bean, a helpful one, or a harmful bean? And we can do that with the beans that we presented during the game phase. And we found this really interesting asymmetry. People showed us better evidence of learning the negative beans than the positive beans. That's in terms of accuracy. Yes, in terms of whether that type of bean, so for example, circle, circles with few speckles are good. How, how well can you tell me when I present you with a bean that is circular with few speckles that it is good? How well can you tell me that? So yes, in terms of their accuracy, we found that people were more accurate with the negative beans than with the positive beans. And that, that just was a puzzle. Hmm. So it was, a, it was a kind of base, an asymmetry that we had to make sense of. But then there was a second asymmetry that was also fascinating. We presented beans that people had never seen during the game phase. Okay, so in our 10 by 10 matrix, 36 beans had been presented during the game phase, but we've got a whole bunch of other beans that we never showed people. But those beans vary in their resemblance to a positive or negative bean. So we could present those, and now we can assess, do people's attitudes generalize? If a bean more closely resembles a known positive, is it more likely to be thought of as positive? Yeah, that turns out to be true. If a bean more closely resembles a known negative, it's more likely to be thought of as negative. That turns out to be true. What happens if we present a bean that is in our 10 by 10 matrix, equidistant from positive and negative beans. It resembles a positive beans and resembles negative beans equivalently. Turns out people will think those are negative. The average person thinks they are negative. So negative attitudes actually end up generalizing more strongly. They have a stronger pull on novel stimuli. We're more likely to generalize from negative information than from positive signals. So those were the two asymmetries that emerged in the initial BeanFest work that turned out to fascinate us. And was that all exploratory? So you just said, we're going to invent this game and see what happens. It, and very it turns much. Out. <laughs> the initial work was very much exploratory. The thought was, can we demonstrate that people learn attitudes as a function of the choices they make as they explore this virtual world, and then that those attitudes generalize. That, that was the goal. Just can we demonstrate that? We did not expect asymmetries to emerge. But they were clearly there. And interesting, interestingly, Dick Iser was developing connectionist models of the same thing. And at least with respect to the learning asymmetry, the damn computer model was showing the same consequence. <laughs> it, too, was showing a negativity bias. Hmm. So that got us fascinated with those two different kinds of biases, two asymmetries. It turned out that unknowingly, we had built a feature into the BeanFest game that turned out was critical. And we discovered it was critical because we kept trying to make this negativity bias in learning go away. And we couldn't make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, there was one point at which we thought, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have the beans be about energy and life and death survival. What if, what if we make the beans be 
about assets and the accumulation of wealth. So your goal is to accumulate assets, and there's no upper limit. In Beanfest, the original survival mode, once you got to 100, that was as high as you could go as your energy level. If you ever got to zero, you were dead. Mm -hmm. But in this version, there was no upper limit. People could accumulate as much wealth as you could, as they wanted. And we even had a bonus system in the experiment. So for something like, for, for every, every bean that they got correct in the test phase, they would get five cents. Well, people were walking out of my laboratory with $20 <laughs> after 30 <laughs> minutes of their time. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing so well in terms of, quote, accumulating wealth. But even then, they were still showing us this negativity bias. But as I say, that, that led to more and more. What, what is the feature here that's leading to this? And it turned out we had built a contingency into the game, the learning phase, whose importance we didn't really recognize until our failures to make the effect go away. The contingency that we built in was that if you selected a bean, if you chose to eat it or to choose it in the asset version, then you got to see mm. whether it had a positive or a negative impact on you. If you choose to avoid the bean, we never told you that information. Mm -hmm. You never got any feedback. And that was intended to represent the real world, mm -hmm. right? If you avoid something, there's no gain in information. So what we were picking up on is what I now refer to as a fundamental asymmetry between approach and avoidance behavior. Mm -hmm. Approach behavior allows for gathering new information, allows for feedback, tells you whether you were right or not. Avoidance behavior was just an assumption mm -hmm. <laughs> that you were right in avoiding. And it turned out that that was the key. That's what happened in terms of the development of this negativity bias in learning. So if you have a misperception that a bean is positive, what's going to happen? Well, you think it's positive. It comes up. You choose it. Mm -hmm. You learn it's negative. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have a misperception that a bean is negative. You don't test. You avoid. You continue to believe it is negative. You never get corrective feedback. And that, it turned out, was responsible for the negativity bias in learning. So... When we remove that contingency, when we ran what we call a full feedback version, where when people chose to avoid, they were shown what would have happened if they had eaten that bean. The effect went away. The negativity bias went away. So that, that itself was fascinating because it suggested that I mean, again, we're dealing with a virtual world here, but we're trying in the laboratory to, to capture, to bottle real-world phenomenon. And what this tells us about that real-world phenomenon is that by our very own avoidance behavior, <laughs> we actually come to think that more things in the world are negative than really are. <laughs> Right? We come to see the world as harsher than it really is mm -hmm. because our negative opinions never get tested. They never get, we never get corrective feedback. So th in that sense, Beanfest was so exciting because it, it revealed something that it would be impossible to know unless you bottled this in the laboratory. But it showed just how important approach versus avoidance behavior was. So that, that's still one of my most favorite experiment, experiments or series of experiments because I think it showed the, the essence of social psychological experimentation in the laboratory and what you can do when you bottle phenomena in the laboratory.
But the, and and that's part one. So to go back to something I said earlier, like someone listening to this might be like, "Oh my god, I don't care if you like beans; <laughs> they're beans." Uh, but you would not be this excited about a game about beans if it didn't say something bigger about the world we actually do live in. So could you give an example of of how some of the things that you've been discovering with Beanfest? Either you know they do apply to real-world scenarios, or you can at least imagine this is what it would look like in a concrete experience you're probably actually likely to have. Sure. Uh, two examples. One's rather mundane. Food choices. Mm -hmm. So Beans do, or otherwise. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, yeah, well beyond beans. Uh -huh. But do people choose to sample different kinds of seafood? Or have they developed a negative attitude to the category that's possibly entirely unwarranted and as a result deny themselves what would be really pleasurable experiences? More critically, think about prejudice and attitudes toward different social groups, different kinds of people. One could develop a negative attitude toward a whole group of people. And it leads to avoidance behavior, which again, because of avoidance, never allows for corrective feedback. So our negative stereotypes, our negative prejudices aren't as likely to be corrected. And we maintain them over time simply as a function of our avoidance behavior. In fact, one of the experiments that we did in the Beanfest paradigm was exactly that. We created culturally transmitted prejudices in the laboratory. <laughs> so we told people about Beanfest, and we said, okay, but we're not so much interested in how individuals learn. We're interested in learning across generations of people. So I've got a set of folders here. Pick one out. And in that folder, you will find information from a first-generation partner and a second-generation partner. That first-generation partner would offer a comment might say something like, circles were a few speckles. I don't know why, but I just came to think they were bad. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd avoid them. Try to stay away from them. That's about the only hint I can give you, but try to stay away from them. And then the second generation partner's report said, oh, thank you, first generation partner. That was a really valuable hint. I stayed away from circles with few speckles, and as a result, that really helped me do well in the game. And then we look at what the participant themselves does. And sure enough, somebody who's received a culturally transmitted negative prejudice about circles with few speckles is going to stay away from them. They avoid them. They don't even test. Now, if circles were few speckles were in fact bad, okay, <laughs> that cultural transmission has helped me. But if circles with few speckles were good, I've avoided what is a good group of beans. I've avoided what could have been a very pleasant opportunity. So, so in the experiment, you're not just conveying a stereotype, but you're also tinkering with whether it's true or not. Exactly. So we're manipulating positivity or negativity of the prejudice that's conveyed and whether the prejudice is accurate or not, positivity or negativity of the bean itself. So we might communicate that circles with few speckles are good when they're actually bad. Well, what happens? A culturally transmitted positive prejudice leads people to approach. They learn that it's bad. Their mistaken positive stereotype gets corrected, but mistaken negative stereotypes do not get corrected. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a really nice illustration of what can happen in the real world when we're dealing with people who with whom we do not have much experience potentially because they're from underrepresented groups. We may not necessarily have had much contact with them, but the initial prejudices that we carry, possibly simply because of cultural transmission, can actually affect our decisions to approach, to engage or not. And that has consequences for that attitude being maintained over time. 
Has this affected your own decision making? Are you quicker to try an unusual food item or <laughs> talk to someone who you might have had a first impression go the opposite way on? There's no question that it has led mm-hmm. to that. That I, I, I'm much more willing to now test, okay, I never had that particular kind of preparation before. Maybe I should try that food. (laughs) And as a result, it's been beneficial. I've had some very positive experiences that I otherwise would not have had. So, yes, yes, it it really has affected me in that case. But but the other thing, to get back to the the second asymmetry that we find in BeanFest, it's this fascinating asymmetry having to do with generalization. People's negative attitudes seem to generalize much more strongly. So it takes, it takes less resemblance to a known negative to be declared negative than it takes for resemblance to a known positive to be declared positive. That's not a phenomenon we have ever been able to make go away. <laughs> okay? <laughs> On average, people have a strong negativity bias in their uh, generalization of behaviors. And I think there are many reasons for that. Um, negativity, we've come to learn, is rather unusual. You know, in our day-to-day lives, Again, because attitudes are so functional for us, because if there's any possibility that it's something is negative, we avoid it, we have largely positive experiences. Mm. It's rare to actually mm. experience negativity. That rarity in and of itself makes negative information, I think, generally more impactful. And we see on average that people do respond to negative signals more strongly than positive signals when they're evaluating a novel object. However, there's some variability along those lines. It's not like everybody does the same thing. That's the average. We can, in fact, find people who have a strong negativity bias. We can find people who have actually a strong positivity bias. There's variability along that continuum. Many more people have a negativity bias than a positivity bias. But there is this naturally occurring variability. And that became fascinating over the last, whatever it now is, probably longer than I want to remember, 10 to 15 years as we've examined individual differences in valence weighting tendencies. And we can use BeanFest to assess that. So we can look at people's generalization tendencies during that test phase, and we can identify the extent to which they have a positive or a negative weighting bias. And that turns out to have consequences for how they make judgments in novel situations where, again, there's positive and negative inputs. So one of my favorite examples comes from some work that a recent student has uh, uh, has done. This is work by Javier Granado Samayoyo. And Javier created this really interesting situation in the laboratory where people are studying for a test. Okay, well, it's kind of fascinating when people have to study for a test because ultimately people decide when they've done enough. Hmm. Have I done enough? Am I ready? Am I ready for the challenge? People have to make that assessment. And as they're making that assessment spontaneously on their own, there's positive and negative signals. Well, I feel pretty confident about this material. Ah, here's some other stuff that I'm not that confident about. But overall, well, it turns out people's valence weighting tendencies as measured in BeanFest predict whether they continue to study or terminate. So people who have a positive valence weighting bias are more likely to come to the conclusion, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Give me that test. I can do well. So as a result, they don't study as much. And as a result, they do not perform as well on the actual test. But that's an example of a situation where we're assessing something novel, and there are both positive and negative signals. And we we have to come to some weighting of those signals. And individual differences in that weighting can 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 have an effect. We've done similar sorts of things in the context of students' first few weeks on campus. 
you know, when you think about it, that's that's really a very, very unusual situation. Here's a 18, 19-year-old thrown into a situation where they probably have very, very few friends. You know, maybe one or two people accompanied them from their high school. But they're meeting strangers on a regular basis every day for those first few weeks in their dormitory, in their classes, whatever. Some people thrive in that situation and end up making a number of new relationships, developing a number of friendships. Well, we actually have evidence that it's people with a more positive weighting bias who are more likely to develop those kinds of social relationships during those first few weeks on, on campus. They're going to be more, more receptive to overtures. They're going to interpret nonverbal behaviors more positively. They're going to interpret signals that, oh, this is the development of a friendship more positively. And in fact, they're more likely to develop friendships over those first few weeks on campus. So that's a good example of how something that we assess in the context of the laboratory be, be with, with something as seemingly silly as beans <laughs> ends up having predictive power in the real world. So from first-year freshmen sleeping on cots to first-year freshmen making new <laughs> friends, <laughs> we've come full circle. Uh, and, and I just want to say thanks for taking... I mean, there's plenty of stuff that you've done in your career that we've glossed over, but I'm, I'm appreciative for, for the time that we had here together right now. Well, thank you, Andy. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. I've been a long admirer of your podcast and what you've accomplished these last couple of years with it. All righty, that'll do it for this episode of Opinion Science. Great, big, sincere thank you to Russ Fazio for meeting me at a radio station just off of campus to talk about his career. And also, thanks to Russ Fazio for all of his time in other ways over the years. I have really appreciated getting to know him. If you're itching to catch up on Russ's work by reading nearly 200 articles that he's been involved in over the years, you can find his website in the show notes. Also, thanks to the folks at WOSU for letting me rent the, the studio and uh, for their help in, in getting things set up. For more about this show, head on over to opinionsciencepodcast.com for all the episodes, links to fun stuff, transcripts for a lot of the episodes, and ways to help the show run, financially or in spirit. Be sure you're subscribed to the show or follow it on your favorite podcast player. There's a lot of good stuff on the horizon, and you don't want to miss it. Okay, uh, well, that's it, I think, as far as outros go. Uh, thank you for being here, and I'll see you in a couple weeks for more Opinion Science. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.